We are live, Scott. We are live. Hello, and welcome to the 2020 Kentucky History Awards presented by the Kentucky Historical Society. I'm Scott Alvey, and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director of the Kentucky Historical Society. Tonight, I'm coming to you live from the House Chamber of the Old State Capitol, the traditional site of the Kentucky History Awards. But tonight, I first must thank our staff who have reimagined tonight's celebration. I hope you enjoy it. We may have a few technical difficulties, and all videos will be available following the presentation on our YouTube channel. Each year we recognize outstanding achievements across the Commonwealth that promote the preservation, awareness, and appreciation of Kentucky history. We are excited to share this incredible network of people with you, and this year's awards will show their dedication to the field in ways that inspire us all. Before we get to the awards categories, I want to extend a special thanks to our sponsor, the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation. Because of their stewardship and donations from individuals like you, the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation continues to support programs and services like the Annual History Awards. We encourage you to visit our site, become a member, and join the foundation in supporting Kentucky history. Here at the Kentucky Historical Society, we engage, we educate and engage the public through Kentucky history in order to meet the challenges of the future. But we also understand we must work together in order to meet those challenges of this moment. It's understood that COVID-19 forced all of us to reimagine the way we interact with one another. And I commend Kentucky's history organizations as they met this challenge head on. Museums, libraries, and historical societies changed course with very little notice and continued to serve Kentucky communities with thoughtful intention. From development of virtual programs to the management of limited resources, we understand it has not been an easy year for many of our friends and colleagues. We join you in celebrating accomplishments and mourning lost opportunities. Above all, we applaud the resilience and tenacity of Kentucky's communities, and tonight we showcased the very best of them. This evening, you will hear from several KHS staff and board members, along with members of the community and the award winners themselves. While this year's awards are different than ever before, we believe the work still speaks for itself. It is my honor to present to you the 2020 Kentucky History Awards. Hello, I'm Amanda Higgins, the Community Engagement Administrator at the Kentucky Historical Society and the Program Chair for the Annual History Awards. Although we are not physically together in the old state capitol, we are honored to recognize Kentucky's best history related projects from local history organizations, authors, and communities. The program begins with a nomination process in several different categories. And through a journey of nomination, letters of support, and adjudication by an internal advisory panel, a winner is chosen that best exemplifies each category for work completed in that specific year. These awards are for projects completed between January 1st, 2019 and May 31st, 2020. The annual history awards illustrate how essential history is to the Commonwealth. They bring attention to our shared experiences and help us all think about what it means to be a Kentuckian. Here at KHS, we deeply appreciate this commitment to Kentucky history and are delighted to celebrate you and your work. We begin our awards with an incredible honor, one that connects the power of our past with the promise of our future. To present the 2020 Gilder Lehrman Kentucky History of the Year Award, please welcome KHS Teacher Programs Manager, Claire Gowaltney. Thank you, Mandy. On behalf of the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, it is my honor to award the Kentucky History Teacher of the Year Award. Gilder Lehrman is one of the country's leading organizations dedicated to K-12 history education. 
and each year they honor one teacher from every state. The honorees receive a $1,000 honorarium, educational materials for their school library, and an invitation to Gilder Lehrman's annual teacher seminar. One of these educators is chosen as the National History Teacher of the Year. In Kentucky, the teacher who earned this prestigious honor is Jamie McCoy Allen of Louisville. Ms. Allen teaches at Eastern High School in Jefferson County and has been in the classroom for over a decade. She holds two master's degrees from the University of Louisville, one in secondary education and the other in early American history and has earned several teaching awards for her work in the field. Jamie has been extremely active in social studies initiatives at both the school and district levels. She is passionate about inquiry teaching and believes it promotes the complexity of student thinking. For Ms. Allen, by allowing students to question and pursue their own learning, they not only become adept at crucial skill sets, such as locating and evaluating primary and secondary sources, but they also gain confidence in the expression of personal opinions and show sustained interest in classroom learning. I am so pleased to present this award on behalf of Gilder Lehrman and the Kentucky Historical Society. Please join me in congratulating the Kentucky History Teacher of the Year, Jamie McCoy Allen. I went to University of Louisville for both um, a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in history. And then I also went there as well to get a master of arts in teaching. When I graduated with uh, my first master's, I thought I would go into um, maybe museum work or library work. Um, and I got into that and I was lucky enough that my mentor at UofL, Dr. Wayne Lee, who's now at UNC Chapel Hill, allowed me to teach part-time in the history department and I loved it. That's what helped me to determine that I wanted to be a teacher and eventually go into high school teaching. Inquiry education helps to engage students in the material. History has moved from content coverage to skills-based learning and so as a part of that students need to be able to read complex readings, um, they need to be able to think about that information and write about that information and talk about that information. So um, by starting with an interesting question um, and giving kids sources that interest them, maybe have famous names attached, maybe have local interest involved in them, and then kids can use those to then answer those questions, think about those questions, write about those questions, um, that all of that helps support kids learning and helps them to understand history is complex. There are different interpretations of things that have happened in history, and that's okay if we interpret things differently. Students need to, to be interested in what they're learning, and um, it's my job as the teacher to set them up to be interested by giving them interesting sources and interesting stories and interesting people, but once they have that interest, they can then um, enjoy what they're doing and then want to run with what they're doing. And so the point is to move these students from being passive learners to being active learners and to want, get them to want to understand what happened in the past and how it relates to them. Oh, thank you. Wow. I wasn't expecting anything like this. Oh, great. Oh, thank you so much. That's awesome. I appreciate it. Congratulations, Jamie. Uh, from all of us here at KHS, we celebrate you and this incredible honor. I'm Stephanie Lang, the editor of the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, the leading scholarly publication in the Journal of Record in Kentucky History. I'm very pleased to present the Collins Award, which honors trailblazing Kentucky historian Richard H. Collins. The award goes to an author of a published article in the Register selected by a panel of historians and judged to have made the most outstanding contribution to Kentucky history. We give this honor to an author who comes to us from Yale University, where she is associate professor in the departments of African American Studies in history and in the department or in the programs of American studies in women, gender and sexuality studies. For her article, Keeping a Disorderly House in Civil War, Kentucky, which appeared as part of a register special issue on the Civil War Governors of Kentucky Digital Documentary Edition. Today, we honor Dr. Crystal N. Feimster. 
As noted by a Register Editorial Board member, Dr. Feimster's article is a fascinating and richly textured article that charts new territory in the history of sexuality, prostitution, and womanhood during the Civil War era. You may access this article through the Project Muse website or as a member of the Kentucky Historical Society. Visit history.ky.gov to learn more. I am a Southern girl. I'm from North Carolina originally. That's where I grew up. I left and went to Princeton where I um, studied Southern history, ironically, with Nell Painter. Um, even though I think um, Mark Twain said like South of Trenton is really, um, is really the South. So, but it wasn't, trust me. And now I'm at Yale um, teaching um, in the American Studies and African American Studies um, programs. Um, and I have an affiliation with history and women, gender and sexuality studies. Amy um, Taylor and uh, Patrick Lewis, who were very much at the heart of this um, of this project, came to me and they said, "We know you're working on Civil War. We know that you're doing stuff on rape, and we thought, you know, you would be a great um, person to be a part of this conversation." And so we want you to explore the, the um, collection and see what you can find on rape. I don't know why I'm smiling. <laughs> it's not about rape, but nonetheless. Um, the irony is that I went into the papers and, you know, I did my, my word search, rape. Um, and so what I found was a whole series of petitions um, from black and white women, majority of them white women, petitioning the Civil War governors to remit fines that they had been charged for keeping disorderly houses or houses of ill fame. But I had their voices and that was something that was really, um, exciting to me. They were linking up what was happening in their homes when they were or in their places of business, sometimes their homes, sometimes their brothels, to what I was looking at in my um, own work on civil war and rape. There was one woman who had written to all three of the civil war governors, Clorinda, um, Restore, who used the alias Julia Dean. You know, I think what um, the Kentucky Historical Society and the Register are doing around these digital collections are pretty amazing. And I, I wouldn't have been able to write this article and do this research if it hadn't been digitized. And I got to come to Kentucky and I got to have bourbon. <laughs> I, um, I mean, everybody, you know, they treated us so well. And some of the folks were old friends, but I made a lot of new friends and intellectual contacts. And um, so I really feel lucky because it wasn't just that I wrote this article and I got to explore this database, but I think I actually grew as a scholar and a researcher. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful for that. And I'm extremely grateful for everybody who worked with me on this article and helped me rethink some of the things that I put forward in that first draft. <laughs> um, so no, I, I just want to say thank you. Wow, incredible contribution. Thank you so much, Dr. Feimster. My name is Cynthia Tor, and I serve as the second vice president for the governor, governing board of the Kentucky Historical Society. A central function of KHS is to impart the importance and value of Kentucky history education. And our next set of awards recognizes education programs that have shown strong evidence of educational and historical value, but they also display benefits to the organization's community and show viable community support through active public participation. The Educational Programming Award takes us to Warren County and the city of Bowling Green. A vibrant collaboration of community partners from university professors, to museum curators and local librarians created more than a year's worth of programming to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. The program is called Journey to the Vote and was led by Christy Spurlock at 
and Victoria Gordon, both of Western Kentucky University. The team organized public discussions, created a multi-year exhibition and worked to empower school age girls as the next generation of civic leaders. Join me in celebrating this great work. Journey to the Vote is a series of programs and exhibits, and it's an interdepartmental endeavor. It's the museum and WKU political science and WKU history and the Warren County Public Library and uh, women and gender studies. And we've all worked together to host individual programs and events and as a committee, we work to promote each other's events. As it turned out, there was an opportunity through the WKU Sisterhood uh, to apply for some funding at the beginning when we were starting to look a year out at what programming we might do. And they generously funded us at $14,000. And then from that, we were able to leverage another 5,000 through the Boyd Lepker Visiting Scholar uh, Program here at WKU. And from there, um, our initial programming then caught the attention of the Wells Fargo Foundation. And they reached out and invited us to apply for a regional uh, grant. In total, there's been about 10 different events, but just to give you an example of two, we had a panel discussion uh, entitled Put a Woman in Charge, and we had current and former um, women office holders, state level, local level. In February, we did Her Story, and that event was geared uh, specifically to school-aged girls, and so that they could uh, see uh, women scientists and chemists and historians, and we had 18 different hands-on activities, a judge and a renowned local artist so that the girls could see a variety of professional women and a variety of uh, students here at Western. In my classes that I teach that are related to women in politics, it's given our students a, a whole new um, appreciation and access to information that they might not have otherwise uh, come in contact with. You know, I got a much fuller picture of what the 19th Amendment was, what it did, what it didn't do. And I think that's, that's what we've tried to convey uh, with all of our programming, that there is more to the story organizations that are sort of on the periphery of what we do uh, became much more involved in what WKU is about and I think that's been really helpful and I think the impact on women in general in our community has been really um, wonderful and we've had a lot of uh, requests to do programming for various women's groups which has also been a nice outreach kind of thing. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much to the Kentucky Historical Society and to all of my colleagues here at the museum. Thank you so much to the Kentucky Historical Society. We really view this as a great honor uh, to be recognized for our work that we did. But honestly, the, the students are who um, make this all special and who have um, benefited from this and we share this on, on their behalf. This was a group, a group effort and I love this mint julep cup and bourbon will go really nice in here. <laughs> but thank you, thank you to everyone. Congratulations, Journey to the Vote partners. Hello, I'm Jennifer P. Brown, Vice President of the KHS Governing Board, and I'm presenting to you from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. We are excited to see such great representation from Western Kentucky. And our next award comes to you from the town of Auburn in Logan County. The Education Multimedia Award is presented to Rebecca Brummett for her podcast series, Compelling History of an American Other. As the curator of the community engagement at South Union Shaker Village in Auburn, Ms. Brummett worked to bring South Union's collection to a wider audience. In the first episode of the podcast, 
she focused on children living at South Union during moments of crisis. The podcast helps listeners understand our contemporary crises through history by bringing together historical voices and secondary literature to help the audience connect with South Union and its history. At South Union, we were looking for new ways to engage with varying audiences. And we understood that leveraging the technology through podcasting was going to be a way that we could reach new people and our fans um, without having a large financial investment. So we own the content and we create it, um, but we don't have the expense of having to maintain technology and update it. That's for the individual um, to, to do, and it's, and it's right there in their own pocket. So the goal of the podcast was really to engage with Shaker enthusiasts and those um, who had really no concept of who the Shakers are. And we wanted to be able to fulfill our educational mission um, during the quarantine. And we had done some research and learned that over half of Americans have listened to a podcast uh, since 2019. And we thought, what a great way uh, to engage with audiences that are familiar with us and audiences um, who will grow to love us. So with our first podcast episode, we leveraged research that we already had, that we'd already conducted, and we just reformatted it to be appropriate for a podcast episode. So we had done some research on children in crisis and how the Shakers at South Union responded to children in crisis throughout the 19th century. That first episode, I think, really struck a chord with a lot of our listeners. We heard some really great feedback and folks were really pleased uh, to know and understand the circumstances that pushed children to crisis uh, throughout the 19th century, whether that was disease or um, a bad year's crop or whether that was um, being orphaned during wartime. Um, Folks were interested in learning about that. And um, then on the flip side of that, they were interested in knowing and understanding how the Shakers responded to that and what the Shaker, um, what the Shakers needs were. We really want um, our fellow public historians to, to know that this is something that you can do and um, it doesn't take a large investment and for those of us who are operating on a shoestring budget you can certainly you can certainly do it and the barriers to entry are getting fewer and fewer every day you can find our podcast on apple podcasts google podcast spotify and amazon just recently uploaded their new platform and you can find us there as well Ah, I'm so tickled. Mom, this is for you. Thank you for always loving me and believing in me. Oh, that's great. And uh, thank you and congratulations, Rebecca. This podcast, as uh, she mentioned, is available through streaming services, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. I'm Stuart Sanders, the Director of Research and Collections here at the Kentucky Historical Society. Our final award in the education category is the Special Project Award and is presented to Dr. Jonathan Earle of Center College in Danville. He and the center term students produced a dynamic project called Murder, Memory, and Martyrdom, the assassination of Governor William Goebel. Through the research of 30 undergraduates, this project reassessed the history and legacy of the assassination of Governor Goebel. The research encompassed interviews with historians, trips to many of Kentucky's historical repositories, and of course, valuable time spent with us at the Kentucky Historical Society. Dr. Earl and his students combined their research into six podcast episodes in an interactive website, all of which are accessible to you at jonathanearl.com. Let's take a look. In my experience, Kentucky's political history, its cultural history is often confined to the region, but in thinking closely about the assassination of William Goebel, it seemed to me that we could think about a number of important themes that were developing um, around the world in the early 1900s and in the late 19th century. 
So the political murder of William Goebel allowed us to think about much larger histories of violence, emerging capital economies, electoral policies, and democratization on the eve of the First World War to push the story of Kentucky simply beyond Kentucky, but into a much larger global space. So putting together a course at Center College, this was a perfect opportunity to explore the assassination of William Goebel, the only governor in American history to die from an assassin's bullet while in office. And the connection with Center College is also um, a little bit more interesting because one of the alleged masterminds, Caleb Powers and his brother John Powers, were graduates of Center's law program in the late 19th century. I designed the course in such a way that students would be in Kentucky archives as much as possible. So throughout the duration of the semester, students worked in five different archives throughout Central Kentucky, um, mining and unearthing the evidence that was left from the assassination and the dozens of trials that followed the assassination of William Goebel. And I think for the students, it was an exciting opportunity to get first-hand opportunities um, working with um, textual archives, but also um, documentary types of evidence. For the students, this was a wonderful opportunity to gain first-hand research experience, but then to also uh, rework it into their podcast productions. To date, the website that the podcast, where the podcasts are featured has attracted um, over 800 views. And so I think this has, again, been really, it's been a really exciting opportunity for the students to see their work have um, such a large audience where people are coming into the site um, literally from around the country and around the world. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I love it. Great work, Dr. Earl and students. Congratulations to all of you for your hard work. My name is Jody Lewis and I'm the Director of Learning here at KHS. It's clear that the winners of our education awards display excellence and rigor and outreach. And up next, we bring you three winners in the publications category. These publications have strong historical value, demonstrate accurate research through appropriate sources, and use effective distribution methods. I'm so very happy to present the award for private publication to Mr. Mel Hankla and his book, Into the Bluegrass, Art and Artistry of Kentucky's Historic Icons. The book uses material culture to tell stories of early white settlers in the bluegrass and highlights both familiar and lesser known people, including Polly Hawkins Craig and Captain Jack Hart. The glossy images and descriptive analysis transport readers back to the early days of the Commonwealth by drawing on collections from across the state, including the extraordinary personal collection of the author of his Kentucky Long Rifles. And now our 2020 History Award winner, Mel Henkla. You know, the book is really a product of a exhibit called Into the Bluegrass, Rifles of Frontier Kentucky. And as I started to write a catalog of, about this exhibit, for this exhibit, uh, the book just started to visualize. And before I knew it, I had over 200 pages and was well along on, on a book about the, uh, the art and the artistry of historic icons from the state of Kentucky. My interest in the American long rifle and the history of Kentucky was was just nurtured and, and uh, I've really spent my entire life somewhat as a, a, as a historian and, and gathering up the stories uh, about particular artifacts, if you will, that it belonged to special people. And what I wanted to do with the book was to stretch a tapestry. I wanted to stretch this cultural fabric of Kentucky. And I contend that the American long rifle, the Kentucky rifle, is the weft of that fabric. 
because if it hadn't have been for this number one tool of the day that was protecting the families, that was feeding the families, that was migrating from the Western expansion through the Western expansion of America, all of the culture that we like to study and collect, the wonderful furniture, silver, uh, art by Matthew Harris Jewett or Asa Blanchard's wonderful silver, uh, the culture that supported that would not have existed if it hadn't have been for this weft of the Kentucky rifle that held the whole culture together at that time. Um, this term Kentucky long rifle uh, was used for these long barrel flintlock uh, graceful um, long rifles that were being used from the Revolutionary War all the way up through the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans is probably when they started to become famous for the name. But even as early as 1803, this term Kentucky Rifle was being used in London, Boston, New York and the newspapers. That's one of the things I really wanted to do with the book was to try to present it in such a way that people understood that it was an art form. It's been a almost a climax, if you will, for my life to see um, these stories, um, these artifacts to be put into a journal that one can hold in his lap and, and thumb through and, and really read and see the story of uh, early Kentucky. Hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. I'm so very honored. Congratulations, Mel, and thank you for telling the stories of Kentucky's early settlers. I'm Mary Hammond, and I'm proud to serve on the governing board of the Kentucky Historical Society. Our next category is the award for publication of pamphlets or other printed material. And we are so excited to honor the 2019 Journal of the Jackson Purchase. This journal is an annual publication by the Jackson Purchase Historical Society located in Murray, Kentucky and highlights regional research written by Jackson Purchase Historical Society members and others interested in research of the Purchase area. The 2019 volume features original essays on the Knight Riders and their intimidation campaigns, the World War I exploits of a Sedalia, Kentucky native, the role of the United Daughters of the Confeder Confederacy in spreading lost cause narratives, and oral history methodology. The breadth of topics and relevance to the Jackson Purchase region today makes the 2019 issue especially strong. The Historical Society's inclusion of advanced undergraduate work and review of scholarly books to the region is also commendable. A job well done. Congratulations to the Journal of the Jackson Purchase. The Jackson Purchase Historical Society we um, don't have a, you know, really a specific home. We have meetings in different uh, cities like Murray, Kentucky, uh, Martin, Tennessee, Clinton, Kentucky. And um, certainly the name suggests that we focus on promoting the history of the Jackson Purchase. And uh, we have six meetings a year. I mean, we hear talks and presentations about Jackson Purchase uh, history. Our president is Bill Mulligan, who teaches at Murray State. I've edited uh, the last, uh, I believe it's the last four years. I um, mean, actually the, the journal's been around for a long time and the, the Historical Society has been around for about six, 60 years. Uh, but as far as the journal is concerned, uh, we, we try to have a wide range of topics. And I decided to add a book review section. Um, and then I think we have sort of a wider range of scholarly and popular um, writings. Um, also, we just changed the look of it. It's, um, it's larger um, and um, we go through a good company that, that does the printing for us. And it's a larger journal. I think it's more attractive. So I've tried to keep that balance between popular and scholarly. And then again, make the journal look a bit more appealing. So I think we have, you know, considering it's a small journal, we have a good, I think a good reach down into Tennessee and uh, Kentucky and while we certainly welcome articles on more traditional sub subjects like, uh, say, the Civil War, we'd also like to see a wider range of articles dealing with gender issues and race and in business and economics, too. I'd like to thank um, Dr. Uh, Bill Mulligan 
who's here at Murray State, who asked me to edit the, the journal. And then really all the members of the Jackson Purchase Historical Society have been very supportive. And um, all, of the, all of the people who have written for it, I think have just done, uh, too many to mention, but have just done a great job. And so I, I uh, appreciate all those, all those folks who have helped. What a valuable contribution to the field. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to the Jackson Purchase Historical Society. My name is Wayne Onkst, and as third vice president of the Kentucky Historical Society's governing board, I'd like to present our last award in this category, the 2020 Publication Award by the University Press. Our award winner is not only the author of the publication, but she's also a practitioner of our subject matter an acclaimed musician who performs traditional Kentucky ballads, Elizabeth D. Savino features those types of songs in her book, Catherine Jackson French, Kentucky's Forgotten Ballad Collector. This deeply researched book reclaims the life and legacy of Catherine Jackson French, who played a pivotal role in the resurgence of Appalachian music. The book details French's contributions to traditional folk music and highlights never before seen artifacts held by the French family descendants. For the artful weaving together of Mrs. French's biography in the Appalachian ballads she collected, we present Elizabeth de Savino with this 2020 Kentucky History Award. Congratulations. I am honored and thrilled to be accepting the Kentucky History Award for my publication, Catherine Jackson French, Kentucky's Forgotten Ballad Collector. This book details the life of a, a truly remarkable woman, a woman whose achievements include being one of the first collectors of Appalachian ballads, the first to try to publish a large scholarly collection of them, uh, a founder of a very important women's department club in Shreveport, Louisiana, and a member of the Centenary College faculty in Shreveport, Louisiana for 24 years. This was quite a life for someone born in 1875. I was in the Berea College archives and the archivist Harry Rice came out and said, out of the blue, have you ever heard of Catherine Jackson French? And I said, no. And suddenly there was a box in my hands and in that box was what was left of the life of Catherine Jackson French. And I was intrigued because the things that were in the box, they left a lot of holes in her story, but what was there really caught my interest. A woman who earned a PhD from Columbia in 1906, a woman who went by herself into the Kentucky mountains to collect in 1909 and tried to publish in 1910, seven years before the very famous Cecil Sharp and Olive Dame Campbell. This really, really caught my interest, and so I started pulling at threads. I started digging around. And by the time I was finished, I had her story. And I would really be remiss if I did not mention Mary Kay Tolbert Buckland, Catherine Jackson French's granddaughter, who shared with all of her heart, her stories, her memories, and various memorabilia. And uh, without her, this story never could have been told. I see this story as providing a missing piece into not only the story of Appalachian music and American music, but into American history, there are so many women who were important to our history, and so many of them have never had their stories told. So I, it would be my wish not only that people now know about Catherine Jackson French and know about her music, but that they also realize that there are a lot of untold stories. Go get them. Congratulations to the award winners. These publications help us understand Kentucky and the important contributions of Kentuckians to our regional and national narratives. We hope you'll find time to enjoy them as much as we did. I am Judge Tommy Turner, and I have the great honor of serving as your president of the governing board of the Kentucky Historical Society. From here, we switch gears to our next set of awards, which are special accomplishments in the fields of Kentucky history by both individuals and organizations. Each award has its own review criteria, 
which presenters will describe as they introduce the winners. This particular award is one that means a great deal to me, as I knew the person for whom it is named, and I can personally attest to his dedication and passion for Kentucky history. The Frank R. Levstick Award for Professional Service is presented to a current or recently retired history professional working in either a museum, a historic or genealogical society, or other, hist other history related organization in Kentucky. The winner must demonstrate exemplary work and dedication to their institution, but they should also be instrumental in raising the overall professionalism of history organizations in Kentucky. This can be done through leadership roles or active service to history organizations through workshops, presentations, research, publications, or other activities. This year, the person who exemplifies the basis for this award is Mr. Tommy Hines, Executive Director of South Union Shaker Village. Tommy has served in this role for more than three decades and has grown the Logan County Historical Site in extraordinary ways. Not only have they acquired nearly 500 additional acres of land and seven additional buildings, but he also led the preservation of existing buildings and helped restore and interpret the vibrant history of Kentucky's Shaker communities. In addition to his daily work as executive director, he also serves on the boards of the Kentucky Museum and Heritage Alliance and the Green River Heritage Society. It is my pleasure to present the Kentucky Historical Society's Frank Levstick Award to Mr. Tommy Hines. I started at South Union uh, the very semester that I got out of graduate school in, in 1986, and they had uh, never had a full-time paid employee uh, at this museum before, so I was the first. I guess I was sort of experimental. You're never really given all the tools you need in college to, to manage a historic site, for instance, and uh, I've learned uh, a lot of, uh, of skills on the job, you might say. Um, this is my 34th year uh, at South Union. There's been a tremendous amount of change here over the years, and I certainly can't take credit for all of that because we've had staff, we've had great boards, an advisory committee that's worked with us, but we have gone from owning two buildings and two acres to nine buildings and 500 acres that we manage now. Um, and we started out um, just doing school tours with things like candle dipping and, and, and broom making and things like that and have moved to more important topics um, like the importance and the role of women, for instance, in the community, uh, the diversity here in, in this community. We talk more about human stories now and what it took to build this place. So um, there is lots still to be done here, which keeps me interested in my job that it's, there's always something new. There's always uh, a Monday that I look forward to coming to work because you just never know what's going to happen. The Green River Museum was organized by local volunteers in Butler County and the county itself about 1980. So I was involved as a college student uh, because I was in museum studies and, and I was really excited to get to be a part of that in the early days. And uh, we have done tremendous restoration, I have to admit, on, on an all-volunteer basis. I've been involved with uh, KMHA even before it was uh, KMHA. We, we've been through several names over the years, but um, on the board uh, several times, and I'm currently on the board as a regional representative of this um, part of Kentucky, and have about 10 counties that I represent. Uh, that board is growing all the time, I think, in its influence and um, really even now is on the cusp of new things. Um, not everybody's been through museum programs that are involved in museums and uh, what a great opportunity for us as an organization to offer that training to those people. I think our challenge for the future, and, it, and it's this way in, in most small museums, you can't just focus on buildings and you can't just focus on furniture. 
You also have to know about how to deal with a board. You also know, have to know about how to fundraise and how to uh, interact with people in the community and other organizations. And occasionally you even have to uh, clean the buildings. So uh, it's all a part of it and you have to be willing to do it all. All right, it's wonderful. Thank you. You're live, Sheila. Pardon me, I, I didn't see my, my face on there. I think we can all agree that when it comes to Kentucky history, there is no substitute for passion. We commend you, Mr. Hines, and we select, celebrate you and your work. I'm Sheila Mason, an avid supporter of the Kentucky Historical Society, and also a former president of the governing board, a former member of the foundation board, and a member of this current governing board. We all know that the work of Kentucky history takes many hands to get the job done. And none of us can do it alone. Oftentimes there is a network of ardent and loyal people who, who volunteer and help us reach our goals. And we honor their dedication with the KHS Volunteer Group Award. This award is presented to an organization managed exclusively by volunteers or a volunteer group. We look for groups that have made substantial contributions of time and talent for the benefit of a state or local history organization or to a project that helped make a historical organization a more effective service provider in the community. This is no easy task. And in 2019, volunteers with the Lincoln County Historical Society proved they were ready for the challenge. When the William Whitley State Historic Site was transferred from the Kentucky Department of Parks to the Lincoln County Fiscal Court in March of last year, the group stepped up to maintain and staff the William Whitley House and the Sportsman Hill Racetrack. Over two dozen volunteers began working as tour guides, gift shop associates, cleaning crews, decorators, and event planners. They also continue to provide research, updating tours and training to reflect best practices. This group worked diligently to provide a high quality experience through volunteer service, helping the fiscal court sustain the site. Without the work of the Lincoln County Historical Society volunteers, the William Whitley House would not be accessible to visitors. From all of us, we thank you so much for your work. Congratulations. Whenever we first started, I trained with uh, Martha Francis and Jane Van Hook. And Jane is also the president of the Historical Society. The Lincoln County Historical Society already had a volunteer group, but we knew that this was going to involve a lot more people than the two employees. And so we decided that it was important that we get them trained and cra trained uh, soon and with accurate information. Uh, our volunteers have been very, very willing. Anything we've asked them to do, somebody has stepped forward to help. We ended up training uh, over 20 volunteers and they were a tremendous help. Uh, in fact, we could not have done it all without them. For the thousand school kids that in, did come in May of 2019. When we first started out, the uh, children were already scheduled to come, the school groups, and we had to really jump in quickly and that was really fun because they have so many questions that are just things that you wouldn't imagine and it's, it's a lot of fun having the kids. And it's just been great because we all appreciate history. We want to protect our history. We want to educate our visitors about the history that we have here in Lincoln County and how it was so important to the state of Kentucky and our nation. Well, our County Judge Executive Jim Adams and our Lincoln County Fiscal Court, the four gentlemen on that, um, they certainly did not have to accept this from the state and they took on a big responsibility by doing so. So we really appreciate that and we appreciate all the support they have given since we opened. 
We had to learn so fast the volunteers because it was given over quickly and then the school groups were coming. So each of us took a room instead of trying to learn the whole house. Uh, each of the volunteers took a certain room and we learned that room and we stayed put and we would have a person, a volunteer in each room. My room was actually not in the house. My one was on the front porch and I did the uh, uh, bricks and uh, that they were handmade here on site. William Whitley was admirable because he fought a lot of the, in the, a lot of the different uh, military um, skirmishes at that time. He and Esther had 11 children, so he was here to protect them and wanted to make sure that this house was built as a fortress to protect them. And this was also referred to as a guardian of the Wilderness Road. The um, volunteer experience here is somewhat like a family. We had a picnic in the summer that uh, Judge Adams put on and all the volunteers came together and uh, there was more of them when they all get together than you would imagine and we just have a family atmosphere and it's, it's a fun experience. It's not quite like work. It's like we're a family and I can call them and they will try to do what they can when they can. And she did not know anything about this. No, this, so. wow. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Jane. Okay, this is uh, awesome. Well, thank you very much and all the volunteers, um, much deserved. Very, very proud to be a volunteer here at the Whitley Home. Well, thank you very much to the Kentucky Historical Society for this award. Uh, we feel our volunteers earned it and we really appreciate that their efforts were recognized. And this is very fitting because William Whitley actually gave mint julep cups to his son on his wedding day, William Whitley Jr. and Polly. And so we have a, we have a pair of the mint julep cups from the set. So we can add this too for our own collection. So we're excited about this, very fitting. Excited about it, thank you so much. An inspirational example of a community coming together. Thank you, Sheila, and congratulations to the Lincoln County Volunteers for keeping the Whit William Whitley site going. As the Community Engagement Administrator for KHS, it is my job to recognize, understand, and support communities across the Commonwealth. And so it is my honor to present our annual Community Impact Award. This award goes to an organization that provides long-term engagement and expanded access to history and humanities through community work. And this year, I am delighted to present the award to the Clay County Historical Society. Having sustained many years of engaging work, last year, the Clay County Historical Society opened a new exhibition, the Clay We Were Museum, in a space provided by the Clay County Public Library. Clay County Historical Society also hosted the Kentucky History Mobile, along with community workshops and programs. And thanks to an to additional collaboration with the Manchester Tourism Commission and Eastern Kentucky University Manchester campus, the project helped grow membership in the Historical Society by over 100 new members. It's through these strong partnerships with government, business, and community organizations that Clay County Historical Society continues to bring the past alive. By doing so, they solidify Kentucky's history as a means of bringing people together for the betterment of their community. For their ongoing dedication to the continued development of meaningful and intentional partnerships, once again, we honor the Clay County Historical Society as our winner of our 2020 Community Impact Award. The Clay County Historical Society began in 1984. We're very fortunate here that uh, we have community partners that we work with extremely well. We have worked with the City of Manchester uh, this year on a couple of projects, uh, one being historic, uh, we call them banners, but they're actually large decals that are on the walls of several buildings around town here depicting what was in those buildings 50, 60, 70 years ago. We have uh, published a picture book, an award-winning picture book containing more than 2,000 pictures of old Manchester and Clay County. We have the Clay We Were Museum that is directly behind me, which opened in, on December 5th, 2019. And uh, 
It is open to rave reviews. Uh, people are very, have been very positive with their response to our museum and those are just a few of the projects that we uh, have done in the past year uh, in, in conjunction with and relating to our community of Manchester slash Clay County here. Anytime that we uh, have a project here that uh, we feel needs community support monetarily, uh, our community has always responded above and beyond uh, the call of duty in that respect. From 2008 until the present, we've been located in the upstairs portion of the Clay County Public Library, which uh, two years ago underwent a, a beautiful renovation, and uh, the library is nice enough to, uh, to uh, allow us to use this space upstairs. We have grown exponentially in the past five years, so uh, our growth is, is, uh, is, is because of our dedicated volunteers. They are passionate about our local history. They are dedicated to this organization and the work that goes on here, and they are the true reason for our success. We are very proud of what we have here. We would love to invite folks from all over the state and out of state to come visit us and see uh, for yourselves uh, what a nice facility and uh, museum organization that we have here. We would love to share it with anybody that would uh, be uh, wanting to come visit us. We're very proud of that. Well, that's great work going on there in Clay County. It's truly moving to see so many people come together for a common goal and for the common good. From all of us here at KHS, we applaud you. Good evening, my name is Jessica Stavros and I'm the Deputy Director at the Kentucky Historical Society. And I'm beyond thrilled to present our next award, not only for its level of excellence, but also because it's going to someone that I know works tirelessly for the preservation of Kentucky's history. I present our next category, the Kentucky Historical Society's Award of Distinction. This award is given every year to an individual who has made a significant contribution to state and local history as either a volunteer, a board member, or any member of an organization. For our 2020 award, we recognize the work of Tim Toms, who volunteered for years to ensure the conservation of a significant work of art by prominent Kentucky painter, Matthew Harris Jewett. This extraordinary painting is known as the Dead Christ Mourned, the Three Marys after Karachi, and was created nearly 200 years ago. It measures an incredible eight feet by 10 feet and is to date the only known religious painting by the popular portrait artist. After almost two centuries, the painting had been severely damaged and nearly forgotten. Only by happenstance was it rediscovered and Mr. Toms made it his personal mission to raise the funds for the painting's conservation by the nation's top experts. And it resulted in a project that earned an apostolic blessing from Pope Francis himself. In his nomination letter for this award, it was said, quote, Tim's efforts reflect his curiosity, his tenacity, and willingness to see a project through to completion, no matter the obstacles. Through years of effort and dogged determination, the work of Tim and his coalition of supporters finally paid off. The fully conserved painting is now on display at the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky through the year 2024, available and accessible for all to experience once again. On behalf of the Kentucky Historical Society, Again, we honored this year's Award of Distinction to Mr. Tim Toms. Uh, the project was the uh, restoration of a, what I call a Kentucky treasure. Uh, it's an 1824 uh, large copy called the, uh, the Dead Christ Mourned, but here in uh, Kentucky, we simply call it the Three Marys. Uh, it's a copy of a 1604 painting by Anabali Karachi. Uh, 
Matthew Harris Jewett painted this copy in 1824 in Lexington with the assistance of his apprentice, John Grimes. Uh, the Catholic Church in Kentucky uh, began well before uh, the forming of the Diocese of Bardstown, which was in 1808. But since then, uh, we've uh, contributed to uh, the history and culture of Kentucky and over the years uh, have accumulated uh, many items that are tied directly to uh, Kentucky history. And uh, this painting by Matthew Harris Jewett, uh, I believe to be one of the most important artifacts that we have in our collection uh, that is really, in essence, it's a Kentucky state treasure. I was very lucky that from the beginning of this project, I had the support of many individuals, uh, especially the support of the Archdiocese of Louisville, uh, that uh, at the very start said, yes, this project is important to complete, and it was important for the painting to be restored. As a result of the restoration of this painting, uh, it brought together uh, many donors uh, that were able to participate in this restoration and have a direct link to uh, the preservation of a state treasure. We were able to uh, partner with the Jack Jewett House in Versailles. They were able to provide me with uh, confirmed evidence of the provenance of the painting and the long history of the Jewett family in Kentucky. I've told people many times that this project checked all the boxes for me. Number one, it was a state treasure. Uh, number two, it was an item tied directly to the early days of the Catholic Church in Kentucky. Thirdly, it uh, took me down a road that I never would have had an opportunity to go down, which was uh, the conservation of an important artifact. I had a blast with this project and I'm ready for the next one. Oh, thank you. How nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica, and thanks also to Tim for saving this marvelous example of, of Kentucky art. My name is David Lee, and I serve on the board here at the Kentucky Historical Society, and I'm honored to present our next award, the James C. Clotter Lifetime Dedication to Kentucky History Award. This recognition is given to individuals who have demonstrated a consistent commitment to Kentucky history through their work, writings, activities, and support for historical organizations in Kentucky. Winners of this award demonstrate a long-term commitment to Kentucky history, and this year's winner has done exactly that. Tonight, we honor, San we honor Sandy Stabell and her remarkable 30-year career at Western Kentucky University. Sandy has served as a member of the faculty and the registrar and collections curator for the Kentucky Museum. For years, Sandy has focused on the collection, display, and interpretation of the works of Kentucky artisans, especially Kentucky's quilt makers. And she shared her expertise with the Commonwealth in numerous ways. For years, Sandy has, <clears throat> her work can be seen through numerous publications, education, and mentorship initiatives, working with the students at WKU, and in organizations like the Kentucky Museum and Heritage Alliance, the American Association of State and Local History, and the Costume Society of America. For her commitment of more than 30 years of service to South Central Kentucky and its history, we present Sandy Stabell with the 2020 James C. Clotter Lifetime Dedication to History Award. Sandy, on behalf of the Kentucky Historical Society, thank you and congratulations. I've been the registrar and collections curator here at the Kentucky Museum since May of 1988. And um, that's a dual role. I work with the public on donations, loans, gifts. I also uh, research artifacts in the collection, work with exhibits. 
I'm actually also a faculty member here at Western Kentucky University, so I work with classes and students. I give programs off campus to different community groups and things. So I, I have a varied uh, portfolio. And then, you know, for people around the state, I've, I've worked with probably several generations of uh, people in the museum field in Kentucky. You know, the older, you would say maybe the more seasoned professionals, some of us have retired, some are still in the field. And of course, now we're getting in younger, um, younger professionals, which is always exciting as well, because you see they bring new life to the field and profession, and, and that's exciting. Well, I, I think that what I really enjoy is when an exhibit turns out the way you envision it turning out. I'm personally very proud of the quilt exhibits that we do, because that's something that is a collection strength. But, you know, in recent years, we've done some exhibits I think that we're all very proud of as well. Um, we had an exhibit that looked at the uh, Bosnian community here in Bowling Green, and we partnered with the Kentucky Folklife Program on that. And I think that really was kind of, well, it was an education for many of us here at the Kentucky Museum, but I think it was an education for many of the people who came into that exhibit because we didn't know that much about their history and their culture and we came to realize what an important part of the fabric they are of Bowling Green and Warren County. Well, I have a number of projects that I'm, you know, I want to see the conclusion. We have a, um, an exhibit that's going to open next year on, on Carrie Taylor, who is a very important, regionally significant dressmaker. We're also working on an exhibit of white work textiles for next year, and we're going to be partnering with KHS on that, and um, I think that will be an exciting, uh, exciting exhibit. And we've been doing a lot of, frankly, um, getting some grants, doing some upgrades in our environmental um, care of our collections, and I you know, hope to be here long enough to see a lot of those projects through so that I can, I can feel like I've left them in better, you know, better, better care uh, than when I came. The history is important, our heritage is important, and um, the Kentucky Museum is one of, of many museums here in the state of Kentucky that are doing their part to preserve that history. Oh, well thank you, this is lovely and I know exactly where I'm going to put it in a place of honor. That's, that's just really tremendous. Um, thank you so much to all the people I've worked with over the years. Um, nobody does things alone. Um, it truly are, you know, it's a group effort and um, it's been a privilege to know um, and work with many wonderful museum people, um, both here in Bowling Green and across the state. Well, congratulations to UCND on an esteemed career in Kentucky history. I can speak for all of us in saying we appreciate and applaud all that you do for the Commonwealth and for our history. We have seen an amazing list of award winners and the level of excellence is as high as ever. It is in the spirit that we present our last award of the program, the Thomas D. Clark Award of Excellence, given to a local history organization for outstanding achievement throughout the year. For 2020 awards, we are so excited to honor one of Kentucky's finest historic house museums, Ashland, the Henry Clay Estate, for the guided tour, Traces, enslaved at Ashland. Traces launched in March of this year and was built as a community-driven, community-informed tour. The work began over two years ago when a frequent visitor emailed Ashland's leadership team about adding more of the enslaved experience into the site's interpretation. Site staff formed a team and sought guidance from the descendants of those enslaved at the former plantation. They used extensive archival and audience research, engaged world-renowned scholars, and built relationships with local groups, including Black Soil, Our Better Nature, a nonprofit dedicated to reconnecting Black Kentuckians to their legacy and heritage in agriculture. Though focused as a guided tour, the results of the project have informed all aspects of Ashland services, including updates to the signature house tour, docent training, and the artifact collection. A rather poignant result 
of the connections made through traces is the acquisition of a portrait of a man named Charles Dupois, who was enslaved, the enslaved valet of Henry Clay. This portrait now hangs in the entrance of the mansion, a subtle yet significant addition to the historic site, and one that centers the story of the enslaver with that of the enslaved. Traces, enslaved at Ashland, sets an outstanding example of collaboration and inclusion for the museums across the Commonwealth. We are pleased to present Ashland, the Henry Clay Estate, with the 2020 Thomas D. Clark Award for Excellence. Ashland is Henry Clay's 17-acre estate, and it's what is left of his 660-acre farm um, that he uh, developed starting in 1804. What people encounter today at Ashland is the mansion plus several outbuildings um, and a beautiful 17-acre estate. It is a peaceful and tranquil place. Um, and it, and it is fitting because it's where Henry Clay came to escape the pressures of DC. Trace's slavery at Ashland um, was our way of exploring a fuller picture of life at Ashland and Henry Clay's legacy. We started work on this two years ago. I received uh, an email. Um, it was also directed to Eric Brooks, our curator. It was someone who read um, a, one of our historic um, markers on the estate uh, that was about slavery and she told us that she really liked coming here but she found the sign to be um, disingenuous um, and that it did not tell the full story. Through this we attempted to um, add substance um, to this story by telling um, about the people who were enslaved here. And not just what they did for Henry, but who they were as fathers and mothers, cousins, brothers and sisters. Because they were people who spent their life here, not on their own accord, but because they were purchased. And we wanted to provide a greater insight into Kentucky's history as it relates to the enslaved people and also how that informed uh, Henry Clay's view um, politically and personally. We have received a very favorable reaction to this tour and um, I think that's because it was informed by a lot of um, community partners who worked with us, um, specifically Dr. Amy Taylor at the University of Kentucky and Ashley Smith with Black Soil. These two um, helped us frame um, how we went about gathering information um, with community members. Um, and that is really what informed sort of this um, unflinching but sensitive depiction of slavery at Ashland. Just as we've relied um, heavily on Henry Clay's uh, descendants to provide information and artifacts. We're hoping that as more people take this tour and learn about it, that they'll provide us with more information about relatives of theirs that they believe were enslaved here at Ashland. And that will help us create this bridge into the community that deepens the story and, and, and makes it more of a, a human story of the people who lived here. Thank you. Well, congratulations once again to Ashland. As we end out our program, once again, I would like to thank those who worked through the extraordinary times to continue providing high quality history to the Commonwealth. We know it has been a year of obstacles and your dedication to the field has our utmost respect. To all those watching, if you are as inspired as we are, by these initiatives, please share your support by becoming a member of the Kentucky Historical Society. Just visit history.ky.gov and click join. I also wanna make the point, if you would please, if you enjoyed the program tonight, please give a shout out to the staff that put this together. It was an incredible undertaking that they did to make this available. And please share the link so that we can all help support and share the great history that's being done. Another avenue of support is through the Kentucky Local History Trust Fund, which is a tax checkoff on your state income tax. 
This allows you to donate a portion of your tax refund to Kentucky's historical organizations. 100% of these funds go directly to history organizations. And since 2016, we have granted more than $50,000 across the state. So help us spread the word and please encourage your family and friends, board members, patrons, and volunteers to become members and to help support the Local History Trust Fund. Again, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations once more to all the 2020 Kentucky History Award winners. We hope you have a safe and healthy evening and look forward to seeing you soon. Good night.